We all sit far from you because of that. that you might have. There are no uh, business meetings this week, but there are some opportunities for you tomorrow at 4 p.m. The grief group will meet in the room below us, and then um, the extended table is the opportunity for anybody who wants to to come and have communion together, and you can come and just do that at 11 a.m. on Tuesday. And you can, if you choose, also carry communion to some of our homebound members. If you can't come on Tuesday, but you still would like to carry communion to somebody at some point this week, let me know, and we can make sure you get the elements to be able to take it to them. I was going to ask somebody, who knows what's going to be tomorrow? Does, does Thomas know? Our vacation Bible school starts tomorrow. Uh, yeah, so we're excited for that, and that will happen um, the next three mornings. Andy can tell you more if you want to know. And then art camp is next week. So if you haven't signed up your children or grandchildren, please please do that. Um, the last thing I want to share with you is that we have something that's been added to our calendar for this month on Tuesday, July 30th from 6 to 8 in the Beacon we're having an event that we call Unity in the Community, <laughs> or Unity in Community. And this is something that um, Shalana Keller, who's the pastor at Greater New Destiny, and uh, Reverend Jennifer Riddle, who's at the uh, St. Simon Peter Episcopal Church, um, and I were talking about doing things with our congregations together to promote greater um, interaction between our congregations. And so we're going to play bingo that night. Um, and my husband said, you're going to gamble in the church. And I was like, no, we play bingo all the time. It's not for money. It's, it's worth to have fun. But you're welcome to come that night from 6 to 8, bring um, an appetizer and or dessert to share. And we'll get to know um, each other better and play games together. And hopefully begin to have some other events where we begin to have more conversation and, um, and build unity in our community. So... I hope you'll come and participate in that. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to worship in, in this place. We pray that your spirit would move among us, that you would bless us with your presence, with your word to us. Might our ears and our hearts be open. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. Welcome to Wide Open Worship in the Sanctuary this morning. Uh, if, you, if you please stand, we'll get worshiping. Yes. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Loving God, this morning uh, we lift up former President Trump and we also lift up just people in general. God, we pray for um, peace. We pay, pray for your, um, your love and your peace to flow among people that um, violence and hatred will cease. Uh, God, we pray for everybody that was there that saw violence. Uh, we lift them up. We lift up the person who was killed. We pray for their family as well. God, sometimes we don't even know the words to pray when things like this happen, other than we long for peace. We long for your presence. We pray that we as followers of you will be people of, that bring about peace on the earth. We lift up our members of the church that are traveling uh, that are on vacation, we pray that they will have safe travels. We pray for our homebound uh, members that they will know your love, your grace. They will know they are loved by you and the people of this church. Uh, we lift up Vacation Bible School. We pray that every child that comes in this place will know they are loved by you. And now we remember the words that Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now prepare your hearts for a time of offering. Yeah. 
sit down Why you won't turn her down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Why you won't tear her down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't And you certainly won't walk under an umbrella. 
And maybe if you see a black cat, you'll go the other way. Do you know that there's actually research now that shows that preschoolers believe, some preschoolers at least, that somehow the ritual of having a birthday party it is what makes you a year older, that it's that ritual that does it. Rituals are important to us as human beings, and we develop them for all kinds of reasons and purposes. But sometimes doing those rituals keeps us stuck in a way of thinking. So in Paul's letter to the Galatians, which I'm going to read a part of in a minute, he's writing because of the situation there. There were some Jewish Christians at the church in Galatia who believed that you had to become Jewish before you could be Christian. That you had to follow the Old Testament law, the Jewish law. And as a sign of their commitment and faith, men were choosing to be circumcised, and people were following all the dietary laws. And so Paul is writing to help them, uh, correct, to help correct their misunderstanding of what's going on. And so the passage I'm going to read is from the fifth chapter. It's where he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And so over the next several weeks, that is actually what you're going to hear about. Um, it, as Andy and I preach, we're going to talk about all of these um, things that Paul writes in this letter and discuss the various aspects of the fruit of the Spirit in the life of us as individual Christians and as a congregation. So here are these words from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, it's verse 1 and then verses 13 through 26. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become enslaved to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in this passage, Paul is saying that the Galatians who are advocating for following the law have misunderstood what freedom means. Their argument has been that if you take away the law and give people complete freedom, there won't be any structure, and they won't be able to handle it. When I've talked about this before, it reminds me of so many young people that go away to college and have all that structure of home life taken out from under them, and suddenly they're free and make some other choices that they might not make at home. And this is what these people advocating for the law were worried about. The law was there to give guidance and structure we want to have guidance and structure and ritual in our own lives. And we do that because it's a way of controlling things. When things happen at random or chaotically, we want to be able to have a solid foundation. I know in my own life, having a schedule, 
is helpful. <laughs> that, that, that structure that just kind of helps you know what to expect um, at, whatever, at whatever time. And rituals are like that. They're known patterns of behavior. And when we do them corporately, they give us identity. And the law was there to help set clear boundaries about what was acceptable, what was comfortable, what was good. And so it makes us uncomfortable to not have those anymore. I have a friend who used to say, I like the, the sides of my plate pen high. <laughs> I like to know the boundaries. But what Paul seems to be saying here is that being set free might be messy. It might be. But we have to embrace that discomfort and realize that everything might not be black and white. In embracing the freedom that we find in Christ, Paul is saying that then we are not just set free. We are set free in the Spirit. And the Spirit is now the guide, the guidebook for who we are to be. When we as followers of Christ are rooted in the soil of the Spirit, there is an abundant harvest of this fruit. The fruit of the Spirit are joy. It should say the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I hope by the end of this we all can say that by memory. Um, because I want us to get those things into our consciousness. That if we are walking in Christ's way, these things should be a part of our life. But there's some things I want to point out about this. The first is that it is not about us producing that fruit in our lives. It is the Spirit's work in our life. There's a term that we talk about a lot in Methodism, which is sanctifying grace. It's the grace that works in our hearts after we, we've said, God, I want you to be a part of my life. I want you to help me grow in faith. Sanctifying grace is the grace that helps us to become more Christ-like. And that is the work of the Spirit in helping us to become more like Jesus. And it's about entrusting ourselves to the Spirit, allowing God's Spirit to love us into new life, into abundant life, into everlasting life. We have to have that openness, though, to God's power to work in our lives and not be so tied to our schedules, to our guidelines, to our rules, that we're not allowing the Spirit to open us up to what might be uh, in front of us, allowing God's power to redeem and transform our lives. There's a story that, that some of you may have heard me tell um, about Ron's experience with dialysis. Um, he was on dialysis for 11 months before he got his kidney transplant, and it was a grueling process, and it was something that was not easy for him. And um, about six months into it was World Communion Sunday, and he heard me make a uh, something. I said something from the front of the church about the chalice being a vessel of grace because it held Jesus' blood. And what he realized is that when he went to dialysis, he that machine that cleaned his blood, that his blood circulated through seven times, was a vessel of grace to him. So he began to change how he saw that process. And um, as a result, I believe the Spirit worked in his heart, and he became a chaplain almost in that dialysis center where he went. He would go in and he would bless the machine, and people start saying, what are you doing? And he would anoint himself with oil, and they're like, why are you doing that? And he said, I'm receiving a blessing. And then he started, by the end of his time there, he went to every patient before he sat down in his chair, and he said, would you like a blessing today? And if they did, he'd ask them if they had prayer concerns and he'd anoint them with oil. So God used that place and that time to transform how Ron saw that process and how others in that place were affected by what was going on. 
But when I was thinking about being open to God's spirit so that God can transform experiences in our life, that, that's just what came to my mind. The, the second thing I want to share just generally about the fruit of the spirit is that it is clear in the Greek that this is singular, that it says the fruit of the spirit is. And so what that means is that this is not a list of possible gifts. Um, there's other places where Paul does that and says you might be this or that, you might have this gift or that gift. This is, the fruit of the Spirit is, so it's all those things are able to be experienced by all of us. The Spirit can be at work in our lives bringing all of these things to us. But that being said, that they're all one thing in many ways, and you can read lots of commentators about how they look at all these uh, fruit, how they look at this fruit, but we're going to pull out each one anyway and talk about them as we go through the next several weeks. So today we start with love. And it's been said that love is not just one virtue in a list of virtues, but the sum and substance of what it means to be a Christian. Love is the expression of true freedom. If we are freed from the ritual of the law and we have to step into something where we don't have that law to to give us the boundaries, then love has to be the rule, the guide, the, the principle that we live from. Throughout the scripture, you can name so many scriptures that encourage us to love. Love your neighbor as yourself, love as I have loved you. No greater love has anyone than to lay down his life. Love is patient and kind, love is not jealous or boastful or rude. But the scripture that I want us to hear again today is from 1 John. It's 1 John 4, 7 through 12. And uh, what that says is this. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. God is love. The fruit of the Spirit in us is first and foremost love. And I don't mean love like an emotion, a feeling that we have for someone else. The love here is agape, a love that is a call to service and self-sacrifice. Some of us might know what the expression living beyond our means is, that we uh, spend more than we make, and we might live on credit here and there. I, I use this expression to talk about love, that we love beyond our emotions when we love with God's love. It's like we're living on God's credit. When it comes to love, we have to love beyond what we feel. We have to be committed to service and self-sacrifice. We have to decide that we're not just going to love the people that are easy to love, that we can't just pick and choose who we're going to love or who deserves to be loved. And in some ways, it takes me back to what I was talking about at the very beginning with these uh, cargo cults, because I realize our temptation when we read things like this or hear about them is to become paternalistic or patronizing. When we especially encounter people who we think are misguided or don't understand things the same way that we do. One of the explanations for these cargo cults was fascinating to me. The writer said, a social scientist said, cargo cults had emerged as a way for the local leaders to consolidate their power, relieve social stress, 
and or unite communities under a proto-nationalist ideology or a demand for political autonomy. They wanted to control their own stories. And that's often what we all want to do. We want to control our lives. And it's easy though, when we see from the outside how strange this is to us, that we have a, we look down our nose sometimes on others. And as I was thinking about that posture that we have sometimes, I um, was thinking about the political situation in our country. And I, this was prior to what happened uh, yesterday evening. But I was talking with um, some friends, and one of them was talking about how, how can you be friends with people who think different than you politically? And she was very distressed because in her mind, she was thinking people that thought differently than her might be naive, might not be as educated, might not really understand. And this other person said, no, that's not the case. All of us think we want what's best and we just come at it from different perspectives. We all want what's best and we're trying to do our very best the temptation for us is that when somebody thinks differently than we do, we immediately think that they're wrong or deluded or evil somehow. And I wrote those words yesterday morning, and I have been struggling with what to say now. <laughs> because I think the thing that we can all agree is what Andy prayed for us that political violence is not okay in any form, and that we as Christians need to, to agree to be peaceable people and work towards being um, people who, who bring the rhetoric down, maybe, is the way to say it, but that we can talk to one another and model what it means to not um, be so stuck in our own thoughts, in our own way of controlling things, that we can't offer God's grace and love to others. And to me, that's what the Spirit's action does in our lives, is that when we open ourselves up, we, we have to allow God to love others through us, whether we think they're deserving of it or not. Because too often, we try to make those decisions ourselves. When God says every person is a beloved child of God, because of that Holy Spirit at work in us, we can love our neighbors as ourselves. We can live out that great commandment to love one another as God loves them and to be a community where that is our first principle is to offer God's love to everyone. The hard part is figuring out how you do that in real and practical ways. But we are called to be that community where love is what undergirds all that we do, living out that grace. And I think the first step in that is entrusting ourselves to the Holy Spirit in knowing that when you're in those moments when you don't have the words to say, when you're not sure what to do, to take the pause and to think, God, let your spirit lead me. To say that little prayer and then listen for where God may be leading you. And sometimes it's to keep your mouth closed. <laughs> sometimes it's just to say, I'm here. Sometimes it's to do something for someone. The Spirit shows up in so many ways, but our lives need to show that each and every day. As individuals and as a congregation, if we are allowing the Holy Spirit to be at work, then we will show the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So today, might we truly know the power of the Holy Spirit leading us 
to love beyond our emotions. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, might we be empowered to love as God loves. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we ask that that your spirit would move among us, that as we look for ways that we can deepen our faith, that we can know your spirit deepening our love for others, that you can show us how to love beyond how we feel, that you can show us how to share your love and your grace in meaningful ways that invite others into relationship with you that the fruit of the Spirit might be evident in what we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Would you please stand one last time as we worship God? <laughs> Just to be.
invite you go in the strength of the Spirit to love beyond your emotions and to serve God in all that you do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.